Hello, welcome to the podcast of the Comet Student Meeting. I'm Dan. And I'm Alice. Comet, which stands for the Centre of Observation and Modelling of Earthquakes, Volcanoes and Tectonics, is a research group across 10 universities, bringing together lots of people who are studying earthquakes and volcanoes in a range of different ways. Each year, the research students from across these different universities meet up to discuss their research progress. In this series of podcasts, we'll be chatting to four of these students about their research and life in and outside of their PhD, and try and convince you that earthquakes and volcanoes are cool! In this episode, we'll be talking to Mark, a PhD student from the University of Bristol. Mark's research focuses on understanding how we use radar measurements from satellites to measure ground deformation from volcanoes. Hi Dan. Hi Alice, how are you? I'm, I'm doing all right. Who have we got with us today? Today we've got Mark from Bristol with Hi, us. Hi Mark. Hi. How are you doing? Nice to meet you. I'm doing fine, thank you. It's, uh, it's been a lovely day today. I'm getting ready for the Comet student meeting. So, uh, since you're here with us, do you want to give us um, a sneak preview of um, what you do in your PhD and what you'll be talking about at this Comet meeting? Yes, so in my PhD, I'm looking at volcano deformation. And one of the main ways uh, we are looking at volcano deformation these days is with uh, satellites, particular uh, radar satellites. And uh, so that's been done by many people. And what I'm then doing in particular is I'm looking at uh, deformation on a very small scale. And by that, I mean just small in terms of uh, in terms of space, let's say, not not in terms of magnitude. Um, so I'm looking at very small scale deformation with very high resolution satellite data. And uh, I want to understand how we can use this very high resolution satellite data uh, to uh, to get a better understanding of how volcanoes deform and where we might find this volcano deformation that other people are not really looking at right now. Um, so when you say um, small scale is that kind of kilometer size meter size what are we talking here so it's kind of it's kind of between the the two so the the current signal that i'm looking at is on the crater floor of a stratovolcano in indonesia and this this signal uh, is only about uh, 300 by 400 meters Uh, and you can think of this as something that's been bulging up and the center has been moved up by i think about 20 centimeters and what kind of time period is this happening over? What's your time resolution? Yeah, so um, this this deformation signal happens over about a month, which is very quick for something that, that's strong of a signal. Uh, it's very quick. And I only get about, well, I only get data whenever the satellite happens to fly over the volcano that I'm looking at. Um, so for me, that's like every, 12 days let's say so i don't have too much data from a- any particular satellite but i'm using uh, three different satellites so i do get a bit more than that to try and fine tune what what's happening how does this deformation progress through time as the volcano is getting ready to erupt so you say you're monitoring these volcanoes from satellites uh for people who don't know how how, this, how does this work Okay, yeah, so um, yeah, when I talk about measuring this like surface displacement, this deformation of like 20 centimeters from a satellite that's orbiting several hundred kilometers in uh, above the, the Earth, right? How, how do you do that? Well, uh, this is a method called INSAR. And uh, well, in simple ways, this, this allows us to measure the, uh, the displacement of the Earth's surface over a very broad scale. So you can measure uh, how the Earth's surface moves, let's say, with a GPS station that will get you data just where that one GPS station is. But with INSAR, you can get data over a much broader region. And that allows us to look at things like a crater floor, where you can't really install any equipment because it's far too dangerous or nearly impossible to reach. Um, so these these satellites with this, with this INSAR uh, on them, they they work by sending out a radar signal, which you might uh, still know from, uh, let's say, submarines. They are able to then ping off 
other objects to find the distance to that object. So that's how it gets the distance to the Earth's surface. And uh, then it, it does some, some clever stuff trying to get a, a much better resolution. Because if you, if you still remember from the, from the submarine, basically at this big thing, and you just see one big blob, and that happens to be another ship or something, well, we're, we're, uh, these satellites are doing something clever by knowing exactly how they are uh, orbiting uh, above the Earth. They can actually focus this signal and get a much higher resolution. Uh, so that's that uh, procedure is called SAR, Synthetic Aperture Radar. Um, and then to get the surface displacement, we want to measure once. Because these volcanoes, even though uh, I say this is fast deformation, 20 centimeters in a month, uh, you can't measure that by just flying over once like uh, you can with, let's say, a speedometer for a car, the radar gun. Um, because it's still way too slow for that. So you need to have at least two times you fly over and compare those results, take a difference. And uh, the and that procedure is uh, interferometry. And so if you combine that interferometry with SAR, you get INSAR. And uh, that's how we get there. So these satellites are doing a lot of clever stuff in order to uh, have me work on this very small scale very strong volcano deformation. Uh, so you've told us a bit about the method now. And so have you got any cool findings that you've got from your PhD so far? Yeah, so that's this uh, this volcano in Indonesia, right, where I say we've got this, this signal inside the crater floor. And actually, this is the, the first time we've been able to use this, this satellite INSAR to detect deformation on the crater floor of a stratovolcano in a tropical area. So I know there's a, a lot of qualifiers there. Uh, that's because some volcanoes just happen to have a massive crater floor. Um, there's these calderas. They have this massive crater floor. So that makes it relatively easy to spot deformation there. And just last month, if only I, could, I was there a little bit sooner, but just last month, uh, I saw a paper published that looked at uh, volcano deformation with the same technique at a volcano in Russia. So it's, it's no longer uh, just any any stratovolcano, it now has to be in a tropical area for me. But still, it's very exciting. This is a very small signal. Uh, the source for that deformation uh, is also going to be very shallow. It creates, uh, it's, it's only affecting a very small uh, part of the surface. And so the source is going to be very shallow. And so we think it's, it's actually not, let's say, magma getting close to the, to the summit, but actually a, a hydrothermal system. So so this this signal from this hydrothermal system that's also quite rare we haven't seen too many uh, deformation signals from hydrothermal systems at volcanoes before they erupt and so the water is being pressurized by um the volcano the magma in the volcano um to a certain extent so it's not the the magma in itself that's putting pressure on the hydrothermal system but likely it's the magmatic gases so as this magma is rising gas bubbles are able to uh, be exhaled from this uh, from this magma and then travel ahead much quicker than the magma itself and in their path they, this, they encounter this hydrothermal system and this increases the temperature because these, these gases will be quite hot uh, and it also increases the, the pressure simply because you're adding this volume of well, bubbles to this hydrothermal system. And that then uh, gets translated into the surface above, pushing, pushing, and that's where you get the deformation. So you've told us a lot about what your PhD is about, but what does a day-to-day -day work in your PhD life look like? Yeah, so uh, this is where, for some people, it might get a bit less exciting. And that is uh, simply because I don't tend to have to go to the volcanoes I study. Oh. It's very sad, I know. Um, but so I'm using this satellite data and that will be uploaded to the internet in some form or I can talk to like space agencies and get this data if I want to. Uh, and that means that often uh, I don't need to go to the volcano to do my work. Might still 
Um, I still want to go to the volcano <laughs> very much, um, but it's it's not needed. And uh, especially if I'm going to look at like the signal on the crater floor, there's no way for me to go and stand on that crater floor. Uh, it's way too dangerous. Um, so most of my time is actually spent uh, in front of some uh, computer screens looking at this data and actually uh, for me, this is one of the uh, exciting parts is being the first person to, to process this, uh, this data and then see that there's something out there to discover that there's a story to tell and then trying to find out, well, what is this story exactly? And, uh, and how can I present this in, uh, in the best way? Yeah, it is exciting. Like knowing that there's something exciting in the data somewhere, yeah. you just have to be the one who sits down and looks for it really hard. Yeah. Um, and so um, when when you're not doing your PhD, even though your PhD is absolutely <laughs> thrilling, um, is there anything that you, you uh, like to do in your spare time? Yeah, so uh, in my spare time, when I'm not crunching those numbers, uh, I am very, uh, let's say, physically active, I do a lot of sports. So, uh, I do judo. I have been doing that for nearly all my life. I think it's been 18 years so far. Uh, so I've been doing that and not only just training myself, but I also do some coaching for uh, for the kids that are starting out oh, learning judo. Oh, that's so cute. Yeah, so tw twice a week, I, uh, I have like a class. I'm not like the head, uh, the head teacher, the, the, but I help out with, uh, with the class and we have like 20 to 30 kids to teach uh, on those days. From uh, they, they start from about like five years old, so they, they can be very cute. <laughs> wow, that's so tiny. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I hope they oh, don't this... hurt each other. I hope you're not well, encouraging like tiny five five year olds to. No, no, it tends to be if you're nice to them, they'll be nice to you. I mean, you need to teach that to them, though. Um, and also, it just happens to be that five year olds are much closer to the ground, so when they fall, <laughs> it's not that bad. <laughs> it <just> happens to be. <laughs> Especially when uh, when you're on a padded floor, right? So. Well, as a judo instructor, you must be quite good at giving lots of people different advice. Um, <laughs> so, do you have any advice for uh, any undergrads considering doing a PhD? I think most of all, you should put quite a lot of thought into whether or not you want to do a PhD. You want to really figure out why do you want to get a PhD. And I, th I think you almost want to be like one of those five-year-olds that I teach with judo and just keep asking why, why, why? Um, to try and get to the bottom of your motivation. And then uh, from there be like, okay, does, it, does a PhD still fit with that motivation? Uh, if so, then great. I think uh, you'll, be, you'll uh, find a PhD very nice, very uh, uh, fulfilling. But uh, if not, you might want to start thinking about so what what other options are there um, talk about people that are doing a phd talk to them when uh, we're back in uh, in the universities uh, talk to those people they'll they'll have uh, some great advice for you in particular if they're doing something that you like doing um, so yeah gather lots of insights and also if you're thinking of doing a, a phd in a particular place or with a particular, let's say, uh, professor or particular subject. Try and really uh, find those people, uh, talk to them, see what it's like to do a PhD at like that university or under that supervisor. Yeah, I think that's some really great advice, especially about making sure you get on with, with people. It's something that I was told um, when I was applying for PhDs. And then I guess, um, just quickly, is there any advice that you think you could give specifically um, to people who are applying to PhDs in, in different countries? Okay, yeah, so in, in different countries. I would say uh, try and get some information of what the, uh, the application procedure is like. So, for example, in the, in the Netherlands, you will have advertised projects, uh, PhD projects that already have basically a research proposal. Uh, quite, it's already quite complete. Um, whereas here in the UK, you're given a much, uh, much shorter, let's say, uh, introduction to some sort of problem and expected to kind of fit a research proposal onto that. And then in the in the US, for example, where I looked as well, um, 
that you kind you're kind of expected to send emails to certain professors and be like, I want to research something like this, and then give a, a very short uh, research proposal uh, to them, or tr just try and get a conversation started with them, and they'll figure something out together. But in the US, very rarely you'll see properly advertised research projects. So knowing that there's that there are these differences, try and try and really understand them and work with that uh, to uh, make sure you you are basically just as well as those uh, domestic students that will be familiar with the system so if you're like the like old one out it can help you maybe in sometimes if you're doing something special but uh, if you're not understanding the system it might be harder to get into certain places yeah so it really comes back to this reach out to people talk to yes, them and that's yes. how you find out about the differences <laughs> yeah. in in the application processes yeah. Um, yeah, and PhD students are mostly um, happy to chat. Oh yeah, they love to chat. It gets them away from their work. Loves. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Thanks for listening. If you'd like to learn more about the research going on, check out the Comet website. Or feel free to reach out to us on Twitter at SeismoAlice or at Tease underscore size.